appreciate everybody coming out tonight for the next in our Reaching Out While Locked In series. Uh, tonight, uh, you're probably going to recognize the guy, although he just uh, uh, just put his video off. There he is. Now you should recognize uh, our speaker, Dr. Les Anderson uh, at the University of Kentucky, going to talk about organizing the breeding season. I just wanted to let everybody know, though, we, we do appreciate. It seems like, uh, Les, we see the, the same names on here most every week. Uh, we have a lot of dedicated uh, folks that, that are eager to learn, I think, and uh, a lot of the, the same names back. Um, I did a little summary of, of registrations and all this week and uh, let you guys know that there's almost or just over about 250 people that have registered uh, to participate. Uh, and that was from, I think it was 78 counties, uh, six other states and one other country. Um, so I think that's, that's pretty neat, Les. And uh, really so, neat. yep. And we've been we, we appreciate you guys sticking with us, and, and hopefully you're getting something from this. Um, so as I said tonight, uh, Dr. Les Anderson is going to talk about organizing the breeding season. I'm going to give a huge introduction. Everybody knows that Les is our reproductive physiologist, uh, extension person uh, there on campus, and uh, does a tremendous amount out in the field with you guys and, uh, and helps in the classroom as well. Um, and so Les, I'll turn it over to you and let you tell these fine folks what they need to know. That sounds great. I assume everybody can hear me fine. I'm going to go ahead and turn off that ugly picture of mine and we'll get to the, uh, get to the presentation. Um, here we are, uh, in, you know, uh, just about the middle of October. And for those of you that have a fall breeding season, it's, uh, it's getting pretty close and we've got to start thinking of the things that we need to do to prepare our cows for an excellent breeding season. And really there are, there are six things we're gonna talk about tonight, six little things, management protocols that we've got to check off of our, off of our list. And we're gonna kind of go through each one of them. A lot of these are gonna be sound really familiar. I was uh, talking with uh, my colleagues just a second ago, how many different ways can you talk about the exact same thing? Um, but that's what we're going to try to do tonight. We're going to try to organize it in a checklist fashion. Um, I know Dare and Jeff, uh, Kevin, Katie all know that I, I work best with checklists and, and by making lists. And so hopefully this will resonate with, uh, with some of you guys. So the first item, the first protocol that we need to check off of our, of our checklist is a breeding soundness exam. And breeding soundness exams, uh, you, you know, are, are simple. They are fairly inexpensive. Uh, and yet less than 20% of cattlemen uh, in the United States utilize our only risk management tool that we have for reproductive management. And that's the breeding soundness exam. Whoop. Of all the tools that we're gonna talk about tonight, the breeding soundness exam is probably the most important and yet one of the least used items. I get calls all the time, um, just like the rest of my colleagues uh, in, 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 in extension. And I would say 30% of the phone calls that I receive really are concern issues that arise, arise from the failure of folks to, to, a breed, to do a breeding soundness exam. I get a call either from an agent or from a, from a producer and they're like, doc, I did, none of my cows are calving, what happened? Run out, I say, check the bull. Sure enough, they check the bull, the bull's shooting blanks. And the only tool that we have to identify are the opportunity that our bulls have to breed cows is a breeding soundness exam. And hopefully I'll explain it well enough that I'll convince you to get a breeding soundness exam every single year before every single breeding season, about 30 days, okay? Uh, it's so important for us to get these breeding soundness exams done to limit our risk of zero pregnancies. The breeding soundness exam has three main components, the scrotal circumference, 
a physical exam, and a semen evaluation. And we're going to very quickly go through each one of these. This is just a picture of a, of a bull getting uh, the scroll circumference performed. Um, it, it's got to be greater than 50 degrees. You grab the scrotum, pull it away from the body. You take this uh, centimeter tape and you measure along the widest portion of the scrotum and you take the measurement. And this bull measures 29 or 39 centimeters. Why in the world do we care about scrotal circumference? Well, scrotal circumference has been shown uh, to be very highly correlated with semen output and most importantly, with serving capacity in bulls. So the bigger the bull's scrotum, the more semen the bull can put out, and the more cows he can serve during the breeding season. Just to give you an idea uh, of this relationship, um, and, and to talk a little bit about the importance of semen output and, 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 and scrotal circumference, the, this data was collected on about 2,000 bulls, Okay, and what they did was they measured the scrotal circumference of bulls that are around 15 months of age. Okay, and then they did semen output studies. And what they wanted to do is they wanted to find the minimum scrotal circumference that a bull could have before we really started to, ha to be, have to be concerned about serving capacity. Okay, and so normally we recommend one bull, one experienced bull to 30 or 35 cows, and one inexperienced bull to 15 to 20 cows. But is there a, can we push that limit a little bit? And is there a scrotal circumference where semen output limits serving capacity? And that's really what the whole goal of this trial was. And so what they did was they measured bulls, they measured semen output, and then they, they began to look at that curve to see where the inflection point was. And if you just look, it looks like here between 37 and 38, maybe that might be the cutoff, but statistics demonstrated that the line from 35 down was really steep. And the line from 35 up was really very gentle. And so the inflection point was about 35 centimeters at around 15 months of age or, or in that long yearling scrotal circumference. All right, and so what the data has demonstrated is that as long as your bull has a 35 centimeter scrotum at, 30, at, at about 15 months of age, you can run him with a normal bull to cow ratio. So in his first year, about 15 to 20 cows, and afterwards 30 to 35 cows. However, as scrotal circumference decreases, semen output drastically decreases to the point down here to less than 30, those bulls produce 1% of the semen of bulls that are, that are, that are 45 centimeter scrotums. 1%, okay? And so if you've got bulls that are in that 12 to 15 month range and you're running less than 35, you better start lowering serving capacity a little bit in those, in, in, in those bulls so that you can ensure that they get the cows covered. Of course, there's a minimum uh, in that 15 month range or a minimum is 30, but just, just remember that slide from a second ago, 30 is not much. And we don't wanna be down there at 30, we wanna be at 35 or greater. As those bulls age, the minimal scrotal circumference increases so that bulls that are mature bulls that are greater than 24 months need to have a scrotum uh, at least 34 centimeters uh, to pass the BSE. The second component of the BSE is a physical exam, and really that's just a technician getting a, a quick visual evaluation of the bull to, to ensure that he has the structure and the ability to get cows bred. A lot of times that starts with feet and legs. Um, we need our bulls to stand down in the middle of their hoof, and I hope you can see that here, where the, the, the weight is being borne bore uh, in this uh, bull right here in the middle of its hoof. And we want the, the hooves to be square and pointed forward, okay? This bull has nearly perfect feet and leg structure, and that's what we're looking for. We, we want bulls that, that have perfect feet and leg structure. Really what we don't want then is bulls that have that their weight bo being borne back on their, their heel or up on their tippy toes, 
because uh, those bulls won't last very long and that really hinders their ability to get cows pregnant. This is a really good example of a bull that's very straight fronted. So the, the angle from the point of his, uh, top of his shoulder, to the point of his shoulder to the center of his forearm is very long, whoop, <laughs> sorry, is very long. Okay, and what that does is that rolls that bull up and he's standing here on his tippy toes. And if you look, that makes him buck over here in his knees. Okay, and this, this bull is gonna struggle to get cows bred his, his second season. And, and most assuredly, he will, he'll, he'll have difficulty in his, his third year. So we, we really wanna avoid bulls that have poor structure. Another thing that the uh, technician will look for, your veterinarian will look for, is the presence of corns. Uh, corns hurt. And uh, just like my dad's philosophy for me when I was growing up, uh, pain alters behavior. Mating is a behavior. And if an animal is hurt and is feeling pain, they're gonna be less likely to want to service a cow. And so we can, we can get this corn taken care of, but we'd certainly, uh, less expensive to get it taken care of before the breeding season than during the breeding season. The veterinarian will look at the bull to make sure that his eyes are clear and bright. Um, contrary to popular belief, bulls identify cows to breed by visual observation. When they see one cow mount another cow, that gives them the indication that one of those two cows is in heat and the bull goes over to investigate. A lot of people think that it's the Fleeman response, but actually it's visual observation. And so if your bull has gotten pink eye or had some sort of injury or damage to his eye, his ability to find cows to breed is gonna be greatly reduced. The sheath needs to be high and tight, okay? And so here on the left, you'll see a sheath that kind of dangles down. And it's really the sh not the sheath in our part of the world that's the problem, but it's this hair, okay? Most of us have problems with a uh, weed called the cocklebur. And bulls that have pendulous sheaths and a lot of hair here on the end of the sheath has the tendency to pick up cockleburs. And cockleburs have the tendency to damage the penis and certainly uh, pain affects behavior in this situation and we need those bulls to have sheaths that are high and tight and if we can during the BSE get some of that hair trip, trimmed off the end to keep the bull from pick, picking up cuckaburs and other, other uh, substances that will damage the penis during extension. The veterinarian will also look at the uh, scrotum to, to look for signs of pre previous damage. Um, I hope you can see that this testy has been damaged, it's, it's swollen and it's kind of moving up. Um, a lot of times these will undergo uh, uh, atrophy and so you'll, uh, testes that have been damaged will, after they've swollen and the tissues died, then they'll undergo atrophy, it'll pull up and that'll be a, an indication that, that that bull may be infertile. Physical exam also includes a rectal exam and what the veterinarian checks for here really is abnormalities in the bull's reproductive tract, the seminal vesicles, the prostate and the ampulla. Really the main problem that uh, they examine is vesiculitis, which is a bacterial infection in the seminal vesicles. Um, what the bacteria does is it gets in the semen and then that reduces conception rate by 20%, which can extend the amount of time needed to get cows pregnant by up to 50 to 60 days. And so if we, and we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail later, but we need to maximize our opportunity for at each estrus for a cow to conceive. And when a bull has vesiculitis, their ability of the sperm to bind to the egg is greatly reduced. The penis will also be extended and needs to be extended during the, during the exam to make sure that there's no penile abnormalities. There's a lot of different things that can happen to a bull when he's breeding a cow and a lot of different abnormalities that can occur and the technician needs to make sure that the bull has the ability to extend the penis to ensure that the bull has the ability to breed the cow. During the uh, BSE, the semen is collected. The semen is evaluated underneath the microscope and they look at sperm morphology, which is just the shape of the sperm 
you know, are the sperm heads normal? Are the tails normal? And then they look at the motility and that's just an indication of how fast is the swimmer, the sperm are swimming and how much activity they have. After all of this evaluation, the semen, the physical exam and the scrotal circumference, the veterinary will give an evaluation. Bulls will be either satisfactory, unsatisfactory, or the classification will be deferred. Unsatisfactory is certainly uh, very clear. If the bull is not a satisfactory breeder, he needs to be culled, take, taken to the stockyards, and sold. If the bull's classification is deferred, typically what that means is the bull is a little bit immature, or he had, a, had some morphology issues with his sperm cells, and occasionally all a bull needs to do is to clean clean out a little bit, get rid of some of the, the sperm that was in the epididymis, and often uh, that bull will come back and, and can, can, can pass the BSE. But that's not always the case. I've had uh, people that I know that have taken bulls back four and five times to, to pass the BSE, and in my opinion, and in my, uh, in my experience, if they can't get past the second uh, BSE, then those bulls need to be sold uh, at the stockyards. Satisfactory, unfortunately, does not 100% guarantee that the bull can get cows pregnant. Breeding is, is twofold. Number one, the bull has to have the equipment and has to have the athletic ability to get the job done. That's what the BSE is for. The other component is libido or drive. And the BSE does not really look at, at sex drive, at libido, and often that can be an issue with bulls. To, to make sure that the bull is, get, are, is getting the cows bred, we just kind of have to use visual observation. Just make sure that we're not seeing the same cows in heat over and over and over again, okay? Again, only use bulls at grade satisfactory, and I really wouldn't use a bull that's been, whose classification has been deferred more than once. And then the minimum scrotal circumference to pass, the BSE is 30 at 15 months. I highly recommend that a breeding soundness exam be done before each breeding season because you just simply cannot predict failure, okay? I had one professional argue with me one time that said, well, if you watch them every single day, breed every single cow, then, you know, then you don't really don't need to get a BSC done. I disagree because you can't see whether the sperm are binding to the egg. You can't see a lot of the issues that can, that can happen with a breeding soundness exam unless you actually look at it. One thing to keep in mind is that any illness that elevates body temperature for two degrees for 48 straight hours can render a bull totally infertile for 60 days, okay? So if a bull gets respiratory disease and, and they're, you know, out in the pasture or, or some issue where we can't get the bull up and get him treated quickly and he's had a fever for two full days, that kills every sperm cell in the, in the testy, in the scrotum. Okay, so they have to, it, it takes 60 days to grow a new batch. Foot rot is the most uh, common example that we have of issues with, with uh, illness in a bull that, that impacts fertility. The data, and there's actually been two or three studies done on this, is that the data says that if you treat a bull within that first day of them showing physical signs uh, of, of foot rot, so limping, got a little bit of a fever, then you're only gonna have a one to two week reduction in fertility. However, if that bull's infection in his foot is allowed to rage, rage more than two to three days, um, then many of the bulls are rendered totally infertile for up to, again, 60 days. And so if you've had a little bit of problem with foot rot, and, and that, that happens sometimes in the winter and spring when we got our bulls up, if you've had a little bit of problem with respiratory or, or any other illness, just be aware that that's a long-term reduction in fertility for that bull. 
one of the things that really gets people is 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 injury. The the penis will have some sort of damage, a hair ring or a ward or or again physical damage, so that the bull cannot extend the penis, cannot uh, uh, effectively breed a cow. And since the penis is held up in the body cavity, it's it's impossible to see a lot of, in a lot of cases. And so my biggest thing here is this is your risk management deal. Are you sure that he didn't get hurt? If you're 100% positive he didn't get hurt, then the only thing that you're risking is whether or not the sperm is fertile. So the first thing we're checking off of our checklist is breeding soundness exams. And I spent quite a bit of time on that because it, again, it is very underutilized. It's cheap. Normally they only they're 50 to $75 and it's the only insurance we have on the breeding season. The second thing we need to check off of our checklist is we've got to vaccinate. It, it's interesting to me, and I, and I, I know a lot of you, you folks know that I spend a lot, have in the past spent a lot of time on farms. It's very interesting to me when I go on a farm and I do my, the, the initial check of, of, of what's going on with the reproductive issues on a farm. Vaccination is not one of the things that's often checked off of the, uh, of, of the checklist for your mature cow herd. If you've got deer, your cows are gonna be exposed to abortifacients. Okay, so if there's deer and your cows have the opportunity to drink groundwater or any other contaminant that those deer have been around, even if there's not any other cattle around, deer can spread lepto and BBD to your cow herd. And so we need to make sure that our cows are vaccinated and that our immunity is high against the two main abortifacients, that's BBD and lepto. I'm not gonna give a health lecture Okay, this is just really, this is the only slide we're gonna talk about on health. But I absolutely preferred Modified Live, if possible. Um, modified Live gives us a, a stronger, longer immunity to our abortifacients, and in particular BBD. IBR also can cause abortions, but BBD actually, in my opinion, is the largest cause of abortion in, in, in cattle in Kentucky. And in some instances, I've seen killed va vaccines be completely inadequate on meeting the challenge of the viral load in an, in an environment. And so that's why we re I really prefer a modified live vaccine if possible. Of course, we need lepto, vibrio in there, and if you can, some har harjo bovis just to cover um, every base. One of the keys is, is we need to get it in 30 days before the start of the breeding season. Okay, because if we come in a little bit later than that, some of the active viral components of BBD will actually get into the follicle and reduce conception rate. And we wanna make sure that we get that vaccine vaccination done at least 30 days before the breeding season. Read the label, okay, and boost if you need to. Uh, and then I absolutely recommend coming back and boosting at weaning or at preg check so that we can maintain high levels of immunity during uh, the, the entire pregnancy. And then for your younger cows and your thin cows, I absolutely recommend that we deworm them. The next thing we've got to check off of our checklist is we need to make sure that the nutrient status of our cows is adequate to support optimum breeding. Um, I'm not gonna give a huge nutrition lecture, but I'm gonna bring this same slide up. If you guys have heard me talk about reproductive efficiency, you have seen this slide, okay? We have to make sure that our cows are in adequate body condition if we wanna maintain a high pregnancy potential. The cow on the left is in a body condition score three. We can see ribs, we can see sharp hook, sharp sharpness around the hook bones, sharpness back here in the pins and sharpness over the spinous and transverse processes. You can even see a sharpness up here in her shoulders. This cow is not carrying much fat at all. She will be anestrous for four to five months. And even if she's cycling, her ability to conceive 
will be at 30% or less. So even if you get this cow to cycle, she has a very low opportunity to get pregnant. Cow on the right is a body condition score six. So you can see that she, her ribs are covered. She's smooth out over the hooks and the pins, a little bit of fat built up over the tail head. And then of course, she's a little shelfy here on the spine and she's got a little bit of fat down here in the brisket. This cow is in great body condition. The optimum condition to maximize reproductive potential. She's going to only be anesterous 40 to 50 days after she calves. And so she's going to have the optimum opportunity to get pregnant. These are the cows that we're looking for both at calving and at the start of the breeding season. Poor nutrition and low body condition score before they calve increases calving problems, decreases calf health, increases calf death loss, and increases the number of days for those cows to get rebred, okay? And every single one of those bullet points costs you money. One body condition score is 75 pounds, and yep, it costs you a little bit of money to get that 75 pounds on those cows, but it costs you a whole lot more, but it's just hidden, okay? in fewer calves, longer calving seasons, and, and less total pounds to wean. If they calve in great body condition, but then we ignore them and we allow them to lose a ton of weight, we also have problems. Poor nutrition and low body condition score post-calving reduces milk production, delays slightly the onset of estrus, but mainly it reduces conception rate. Okay, and remember conception rate is defined as the, the percentage of cows that conceive at one estrus. Okay, so if I had 100 cows and I got them all in heat today and 60 of them conceive, my conception rate is 60%. So research has shown that we can see up to a 20% decrease in, body, in conception rate if body condition score decreases after calving. So to put that in into terms that we we can kind of get our head around, if we had a normal 60% conception rate, but our cows lost 20% because they're losing weight, now we're at 40%. If our conception rate is 60%, it takes three cycles to get 90% of your cows pregnant. If conception rate is 40%, it takes five cycles or almost 110 days to get 90% of your cow herd pregnant. That's a real problem. As Dr. Lim Cooler and Dr. Van Valen would tell you, as soon as that cow calves, her energy and protein requirements drastically increase, and it's not unusual for us to see a 25 to 30% increase in the demand of that cow's, uh, need, their, her needs for energy and protein, and it's our goal as nutrient managers to do the best we can to maintain body condition score. If our cows milk very hard at all, we, it's difficult to get them to gain weight post calving. But if we can maintain body condition score or just have a slight decrease, then the, uh, the problems that we have with, with nutrition will be, will be minimized. Another thing we need to check off of our checklist is we need to make sure that we are preparing our replacements to be successful, productive cows. And actually, uh, this is probably the thing that I'm doing the most right now uh, for our herds. I just uh, just finished this yesterday for the, for the herd up here in Woodford County. And uh, it is so important to make sure that we get, that our cows get started on the right foot and heifer development is something that has been stressed here for, for three decades, really. But it's something that we need to keep reinforcing because the better that we can manage these heifers that to, to breed as yearlings, the more productive we can set them up uh, for their lifetime. Back in the 1973, one of the landmark uh, uh, reproductive management papers was published it was published uh, uh, based upon about 2,000 calvings done in the 1960s. And what the goal of that research was, 
was to identify factors that were common in productive, efficient cows. And what they found was the, the, the factor that was most highly correlated with productivity and profitability was when the heifers were born and when they conceive in their first breeding season. And it really became, becomes the most important principle in heifer development. Uh, a quote from that paper was that heifers that conceive early as yearlings during their first breeding season appear to be programmed for productive lives, okay? And our whole goal as reproductive managers is to get our heifers bred early. So our number one objective is to get these rascals bred early so that they have an opportunity to become productive, profitable cows for us for their entire life. This data was collected uh, in Nebraska just about, about 2010, I believe. Uh, so much more modern uh, data, but it all consistently backs up the data from back in the 70s. What these researchers uh, basically repeated what, uh, what uh, the research was from the 1973 um, paper. And what they looked at was calving period. So calving period one is the first 20 days of the calving season. Calving period two is the second 20 days. Calving period three is, uh, is the last 20 to, to 30 days of the breeding season. And what they found was that heifers that are born early in their own calving season are more likely to conceive in their first breeding season. So this makes it really important for us to begin our selection with heifers that are born early. In this data, if you look at heifers born in calving period one, they weighed more both at weaning and at pre-breeding. They had a higher cyclicity rate and a higher pregnancy rate than heifers born later in the calving period. So when we're selecting our heifers for replacement, it's very important for us to, to, to emphasize when that heifer was born. And so if, if we're looking at fall calving, a heifer that was born on September 1st has a much greater opportunity to get pregnant early and to be a productive cow than a heifer that was born on November the 1st. A couple of things that we can do, okay, to impact when those heifers conceive early is, is we can affect the age of puberty by first impacting breed. And that mean, and what I mean by that is the breed of the heifer herself. Now, of course, it's October 13th. We can't really impact the breed of the heifers as, as uh, that, that we're getting ready to breed, but certainly the breed of, uh, the, and, and of the animals that were in our crossbreeding program is extremely important if we want to maximize the um, ability of our, of our young females to conceive early in their first breeding season. A long time ago, age of puberty was, was reported to be highly correlated with milk production. Um, and so breeds that milk more go through puberty earlier than breeds that, that, that don't milk quite as much. So if you look at the British breeds, your Angus and your Shorthorns milk more than your Herefords, and those breeds typically go through puberty a little bit earlier than Herefords. If you look at the continental breeds, Simmies and Gelbies, milk quite a bit more than Charlays, Lemmies, and Keys as a rule, and Simmies and Gelbies go through puberty much earlier than Charlays, Lemmies, and Keys. Eared cattle, and of course, by that I mean anything, you know, the, the industry term for ear is Brahmin. Uh, any breed that has a little bit of Brahmin in it uh, is going to have a little bit more trouble with age of puberty. Purebred Brahmins go through puberty at 24 months, and every time we take a little cut of ear out of them, we get age of puberty a little bit closer to ideal. Ideal is 12 to 13 months. We need those heifers to go through puberty about 12 to 13 months of age to, to ensure that they have a high ability to conceive as yearlings. The main way we do that, and I know Dr. Bullock has pounded this guys into you, uh, this concept into you guys for a long time, uh, but the main thing that we can do to improve the reproductive potential of our cow herd is to crossbreed. 
The main benefit of crossbreeding is the productivity and longevity of that F1 female. They go through puberty earlier, they conceive earlier, they calve earlier, they actually have an opportunity to rebreed as a two-year-old and the data has demonstrated that, they, that the longevity, the stability of those animals in the herd is significantly greater than the straight bred contemporaries. So the best thing you can do from a breed standpoint is crossbreed. Immediately, the, the biggest, the best thing that we can do or the biggest thing that we can control is weight. Okay, heifers typically go through puberty when they reach about 65% of their mature weight. We call that the target weight and we want them to hit their target weight about 30 days before the onset of the breeding season. We want our heifers to go through puberty before the breeding season so they can get their first couple of low fertility cycles out of the way before we expose them to the bull. To maximize conception rate, we need those heifers to hit their target weight about 30 days before the onset of the breeding season. And that's right now for you fall calving herds. In my opinion, now is, is the optimum time to get your herd exposed to modified live vaccines. We want to vaccinate our heifers here in this 30 to 45 days before this first breeding season. And we definitely want to use our modified lives here because this is the least risky time to incorporate those, those vaccines and that cellular immunity is, is, is maintained in, for a longer period of time. And so if we, right after weaning, if we can hit them with this modified live, according to label boost, or if, if, if the label says we can go ahead and wait, right here in this 30 to 45 day window, boost them again with that modified live respiratory disease complex, hit them with lepto, make sure we deworm them and those heifers are ready to get to, to, to prepare for breeding. Our second goal uh, when we're preparing our heifers is to manage for calving ease. Just most people that have calved heifers understand that young cows account for most of our problems and that if, if a two-year-old experiences calving problems, they're 16% less likely, likely to conceive during the breeding season. A couple of things to think about. The data, and this is from late 80s to early 90s, the data are pretty clear that, that the longer a cow is in, in stage two labor, okay, and that's active contracting labor, the more likely she is to deliver a weak calf and the longer her postpartum and estrus period is gonna be. As a matter of fact, for every hour that a female is in active labor, it takes her four days longer on average to recycle. So if they're in, if they're in, in, in stage two labor for eight hours, let's say they have a hard delivery and you finally get that rascal out, it's gonna be 30 to 35 days later for that for that female to, to, to recycle. And so that's gonna really put some pressure on you to get her rebred. Highly recommend doing pelvic areas about now. So this is one month before the breeding season. We use a rice pelvimeter. We, <clears throat> we take a vertical and horizontal measurement, multiply those two numbers together to get our pelvic area. So we'll get you know, a 14 by 12, which is 168. And then what I recommend you to do is to use this conversion, this table with conversion factors to help calculate how big a calf that cow can have without having calving problems. So what we did the other day is we had, yesterday we had 13 to 14 month old heifers. They weighed on average about 800 pounds. If I had a heifer come through with 180 square centimeter pelvis, if I divide 180 by 2.3, I come up with about 76 pounds. Okay, about 78 actually. So I'd said what that means is that heifer can have a 78 pound calf or lighter and not have calving problems. We know in our herd here at UK, both at Princeton and Woodford, that if, if we set our cutoff to 70 pounds, 
we pretty much are able to eliminate calving problems. And so we use this as a culling tool, not as a selection tool. So that any heifer that has a pelvis that doesn't support at least a 70 pound calf, we call. <coughs> Another thing to check off your checklist is to develop a plan for your two-year-olds. Remember your two-year-olds are those cows that are nursing their first calf. Their biggest problem is anestrus. It simply takes them 30 days longer to recycle than a normal cow. The length of anestrus in a normal mature cow in, in good condition is about 60 days. Okay, so the normal two-year-old then in good condition takes about 90 days. Okay, that's three months. That puts her past the ideal 80 days that we want to get those get them rebred in to, to keep our 365-day interval. I have seen two-year-olds as, as long as five and six months from calving still an estrus. And so developing a plan for our two-year-olds becomes one of the most important things that we can do from a reproductive management standpoint. Obviously, we need to vaccinate them. Obviously, we need to make sure that they're in good body condition. But the main thing that we have to do with our two-year-olds is we have to induce estrus, okay? We have to give them a treatment protocol that will force them to come in heat early in the breeding season to give us an opportunity to get them pregnant. There are three ways that we can induce estrus. We can do short-term calf removal, which means we can pull that calf off for 48 hours, the first two days of the breeding season, turn them back, turn the calves back in with the cows, make sure that suckling and everything is going well, and 80 to 100% of cows treated in this manner will uh, come into heat, okay? And so a very effective method, but very time consuming um, to get that done. A couple other things we can do is we can feed MGA, which is an orally active progestin for seven days right before we turn the bull out, or we can insert a cedar device, which is a vaginal insert that contains the hormone progesterone. We can put that in for seven days right before we turn the bull out. And both of those methods have been demonstrated to be very effective in regulating and inducing estrus. So now the, the key is, is we, 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 we've got our bulls in good shape. We're vaccinated the cows, our cows are in good shape, our heifers are ready to go, our two-year-olds are ready to go. Now we have to plan the breeding season. And just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, I just threw up an example uh, farm from, from one that we've had in the farm program. These were fall calvers, there was 32 of them. Okay, you can see the date of the first calf, the date of the last calf. They calved over a 106-day window. The, these numbers are the number of cows that calved in each month. And here's the number of cows that did not calve. So we should have 30 calves out of those 32 cows. Okay, and so what I mean by planning the breeding season is we, we need to, 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 to make plans for either a controlled natural service season. And in this example, I've got December the 1st to February the 10th, or an AI combined with natural service, which just has fixed time to AI on our first day of a breeding season and removal of the bulls at the same time. When we get our cows, we need to sort those cows into three different management groups, okay? Assuming that they've all been vaccinated and that they're in good shape, that you've done the job you needed to do from a nutrient status, okay? We need to place cows into three categories based upon when they calve and what age they are. Easy calvers are these cows that calve in August and September, they calve early in the breeding season. They're mature cows in good body condition. Hard calvers are these cows that are calving in uh, October, so the second half of the, of the calving season and all two-year-olds regardless of when they calve. And then our very hard cat breeders are these cows that are calving either at the start or during the breeding season, okay, that we have to work to get moved up, okay? So we have three groups, easy, hard, and very hard. 
So if we're just using natural service, what are we gonna do? For the easy cows, the easy breeders, we don't do anything. We simply turn the bull out on December the 1st. For our hard breeders, okay, those October calving cows and all of our two-year-olds, we're either gonna put a cedar in for seven days or feed MGA for seven days before we turn the bull out on December the 1st. For your very hard breeders, okay, the cows that are gonna be very difficult to get bred, those that are calving in November and December, we wanna wait about 14 days after they've calved, put a cedar device in them for seven days, then move them over into the breeding pasture. So you're gonna to have to have two separate pins here, a calving pin and a breeding pin so that you can handle these very late calvers differently than you do the rest of the cow herd. We've run this protocol hundreds of times in, in, in the state of Kentucky in typical commercial cow-calf operations. And within two years, we can get 80% of your cows to breed in the first 30 days using these protocols. If you want to incorporate fixed time to AI um, and natural service, so we do fixed time, time to AI and two weeks later, turn the bowls in, take your easy and your hard calvers, those that calve in, in up through uh, November the 1st, give a shot of GNRH and put a cedar in on the, on the first day of treatment. So this would be the 23rd, uh, well not 23rd, it'd be, uh, uh, that, if that's the first, this will be the 27th and that'll be the 20th. So you come in on the 20th, 27th, You'll get at 3 p.m. You'll get prostaglandin and pull the cedars, and 66 hours later, we'll time AI and give GnRH. That'll work really well on these cows. The first year, if you've never AI'd, you'll probably hit them in that 50% range. But after that, you'll be easily in the 60s and 70s. I've got herds where we work with for for multiple years that routinely get in the 70s uh, using this protocol. Um, on the easy and, and, and harder breeding cows. On your very hard breeding cows, folks, you're just gonna have to just skip AI, put the cedar in 14 days after calving, pull the cedar out, get those rascals bumped up into October calving next year, and then you can fit them into your normal breeding protocol. Of course, two weeks after we AI, we're gonna turn the bull in, we'll pull the bull out on February the 10th. For your heifers, if you're gonna do natural service, again, feed MGA or put a cedar in for seven days before you turn the bull out. If you're pretty confident that most of your heifers are cycling, you could just give a shot of prostaglandin um, here, or you can combine the two. So on the last day of MGA or cedar, you can give prostaglandin. That'll help bunch those heifers up a little bit earlier in the breeding season. For any of, if I'm gonna AI anything in the herd, I'm certainly gonna AI the heifers so that I can use those high accuracy, high calving ease EPD bulls. Uh, my current favorite protocol for that is a little different than what you're gonna see in a lot of places. But what, I, what we do is we do a five day cedar exposure, give a shot of, of lutelice, which is prostaglandin, and then 72 hours later, we do our timed AI with GNRH. Um, you'll get a few heifers in heat uh, at four, at just 10% of them in heat at 48 hours. And if you can do a 60 hour pre-breed that typically will raise your conception rates. But we've been hitting in the, in the low 60s uh, for about five years on this protocol. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy with it because of its simplicity and its effectiveness. What do I do with the bull? Well, you can either build, build a, you know, if you're, if you're running year round calving, it, it gets difficult. So you're gonna have to figure out something to do with the bull. So either build a bull pen, figure out a way to lease a bull for the 60 to 120 days that you need him. You can either buy and sell the bull or some combination of those. And when I talk about buying a bull, using him and then selling him, people look at me kind of funny, but honestly, it costs quite a bit of money to, to maintain a bull every year. This is a spreadsheet developed that just looks at the annual costs. And regardless of purchase costs, it costs you about $625 a year to maintain a bull. If we factor in the cost of our money, okay, 
on purchase prices between two and five thousand dollars we get we get a pretty high annual cost per year for your bull and of course your bull's job is to get cows pregnant and so your pregnancies cost and so if we're running 80, 85, or 90% pregnancies on 15 to 50 cows, you can see that pregnancies aren't cheap. In most situations, pregnancies are running us somewhere between 40 and, and, and $80 a head, okay? And so if we buy a bull and we spend $3,000 on that bull, and then we sell that bull for 1,400 bucks, okay? And we've got 1,600 in him, Okay, and we get 30 pregnancies. That's costing you $50 a pregnancy. You know what? That fits right in here. That's not more than normal. It's just different than normal. Okay, so think about some of those things when you're thinking about how to buy, manage, and, and control your breeding and calving season. And of course, once your cows are pregnant, I'll be honest with you, I don't care if you leave the bull in there. Okay, just as long as you promise me to get your cows preg checked and only keep those that are kept in the window and give prostaglandin to all, all of the young heifers that are running in there so we don't have any problems with early pregnancy. So, I'm out of breath. The six things we got to check off of the checklist. Perform a BSE every year. Vaccinate your cow herd. Before 30 days before the breeding season every year. And I also recommend a preg check or weaning booster. Feed your doggone cows. Make sure those suckers get in body condition score six. We've got two great nutritionists on staff. We've got 120 great agents, A&R agents in our, in, in, across the state. Utilize these, these, these professionals to help you figure out how to get your cows fed. Prepare your yearlings select those that are bred early so that they have the opportunity to conceive early so that they have a chance as two-year-olds to rebreed. Since two-year-olds are a pain in the rear, make a plan for those two-year-olds two that includes indu inducing estrus. Use the cedar, use MGA, or pull those calves for 48, for 48 hours. And then finally, we're, we're 30 to 40 days from the start of the breeding season, make a plan. Let's get out of here, let's get a checklist, let's make a plan, let's contact our AI tech professionals if we're doing AI, let's get those seeders bought in, let's get the MGA purchase, let's figure out what's going on with our bulls, let's make a plan. Dr. Bullock, that's as fast as I can talk for 55 straight minutes. You did fine, my friend. Uh, I got one complaint and suggestion for improvement, even though you did a fantastic job of in your slides to talk about the impact of heterosis, you failed me at the end. It didn't make your top list and I need it in there, buddy. Is heterosis not crossbreeding? Well, it is, but what I'm saying is it needs to be one of your final, it's seven instead of six. Oh, I got you. Nitpicking yep. me on genetic. I tell you what, folks. I tell you what. So, and I also want to I point agree. out. I mean, we, <laughs> we've got a crossbreed, man. I mean, it's, yep. it's, it's a huge impact. It's the, the reason to crossbreed is the females. As, Absolutely. You, know, you get a little bit of bump in your steers, but the reason to crossbreed is the females. It's two to one benefit of the replacement females versus the the calf that you're selling. Um, the other point uh, that I'm I'm, I'm going to hijack you here for just a second. The the other one is you talked about F ones, but don't feel like you have to have F ones either. Even a good rotation of two breeds, um, you can do a pretty good job that way too. But uh, I, I hope everybody heard you say that basically that, that your job is, is really we don't really need you as long as we have good nutritionists and good geneticists to crossbreed and feed them right, then your cattle are going to get bred. Is that about right? Yeah, feed MGA and do everything else and you're in good shape. Make sure they're healthy. Speaking of which, Chuck has a question for you. Can I give Modified Live 30 days prior to calving? 
if the, if they have been exposed to the modified live in in the past, you can do it without risk of abortion. If they're naive to it, you always have that risk. And most of the labels, I think, still say not to do it if they if they're naive to the modified live. If Dr. Arnold's on, she can she can chime in and correct me if I'm if I'm wrong there. But that's the rule that I go by. If they if they're naive. I don't give it pre-calving. If they are not naive, um, then I don't have a problem. If they've been if they've been vaccinated with modified live previously. So the the important thing there, Les, is is if you're keeping back your own replacements, which most people do, is to get them get them vaccinated that first time before they are pregnant with a modified okay. live. That's exactly right. And actually, uh, there's quite a bit of data right now that says if you not quite a bit. There's some data that says if you, you know, as, as heifers, so right after weaning, hit them with that modified live. And if you're, if you've got a boost, then just whatever, according to the label, come back in pre-breeding. You can actually use the kill viruses quite a bit. Okay. In, in their life. And that you maintain a very high level of immunity. So you don't have to use a modified live every single time to get high immunity. Um, we, we just, at the Beef Efficiency Conference this year, uh, one of the uh, uh, veterinarians uh, from Auburn, and I keep forgetting the guy's name, but anyway, really good, really good uh, discussion on that. So actually getting a great boost in immunity with killed viruses if the animals have been exposed to modified live prior. Okay. Uh, Katie, I'm having trouble. Uh, for some reason, it shows me as a co-host, but it's not giving me the option to share my screen. I need to put up uh, the next one. Can you help me out here? I, Dare, I, I pulled up the chat here. To me, privately, there was a question that says, what would you feed the calves that you pull for 48 hours? Kevin, that's a great question. Uh, I have done this both experimentally on, on two of the farms that I managed. And I, I always put uh, a, a, a loose hay out there. So in the, the last farm, we did some alfalfa hay um, and water, and they didn't eat a lick. Um, Jeff, Katie, you guys might chime in here. I didn't, I didn't get, they didn't eat anything. Um, and when, when I turned them back out with the cows, they were ready to nurse. Um, and so uh, I had loose hay available for them. Um, but you know most of these calves are pretty young and 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 none of them are bunk broke and so they really don't eat much for for about 48 hours all right is that up there now now it is all right good deal thanks katie um so just while you're thinking about other questions and, and you guys, you can either put it in the chat or you can also unmute yourselves if you have a, a question, um, but uh, just shoot them out and, and we'll get those answered. Uh, just to remind you guys that uh, in two weeks, and I apologize for last week, I, I put a scare in less. He was ready to go though when, uh, when he saw the invitation come out. He said, I thought it was next week, but I can do it tonight. Uh, I apologize to you guys. I, I just got ahead of myself, um, but we got it straightened out. And um, so in two weeks, Dr. Van Valen is going to give us a talk on preparing for winter feeding. Um, and for tonight's session, uh, if you need to get uh, the educational credit for CAPE, uh, the code that goes into the, instead of getting the, the speaker signature, just put in Be Free Pro. Um, and talk to your county agent and, and uh, make sure some county agents have a little different uh, way they're handling the, the, the CAPE uh, education part. So make sure you talk to your county agent, uh, make sure you have everything done right, but uh, they should be able to help you out there. Any other questions for Dr. Anderson? Man, they're letting you off easy tonight, Les. I don't, I don't know what's going on. Must have, must have put them all to sleep. Probably talk so fast they didn't catch anything I said. Oh, I had another one for you. Um, you know that I can't 
leave tonight as well without talking about EPDs. When you were talking about scrotal circumference um, and you talked about getting a scrotal circumference measurement, um, is that better than the EPD or what do they need to be doing there? From a repro standpoint, scrotal circumference EPD doesn't mean a whole lot to most of my commercial guys. Um, seed stock guys, certainly. Um, but uh, the end of it, that bull's individual scroll circumference is, is what's important for that bull's individual ability to breed a cow. So if, if, you're, if, you, if you're a seed stock guy, scroll circumference becomes more important. But if you're, if you're buying bulls, or you're using bulls in a commercial cow-calf operation, honestly, it's just his individual scroll circumference is what matters. So some people might think we're ready to fight, but you know as well as I know I was setting you up on that one. But uh, it's absolutely right, folks. On for for commercial producers, it's that actual measurement. Uh, it's the only only trait that you ever hear me say that about. But uh, for scroll circumference, it's the actual measure for a commercial guy. For you seed stock guys, uh, keep selecting based on scroll circumference EPD to be able to sell those bulls with large scroll circumferences. So uh, just wanted to make sure we had that clear. Any other questions? Katie, Kevin, any of you guys? I think uh, I think Jeff. Um, we lost Jeff somewhere in the process. Late, I saw. But uh, Katie or Kevin, any any last words for the folks? Katie, Kevin, if we've got a cow on a body condition score four now, okay, and and she's lactating, and we got to get her as close as we can to five in forty five days. What do we What do we feed her? So in order to get that turnaround that quickly, you're going to have to probably feed some supplemental feed, um, something with some protein in it, as well as some energy, uh, so that she can overcome not only the, the demands of lactation, but also uh, put back on that body weight. So if we think about uh, meeting energy and protein demands for lactation, that's sort of just enough to keep them even. And so uh, we're going to have to go a little bit extra to overcome that and put a body condition score back on that, on that female. So um, my best suggestion would be to work with a nutritionist on a kind of a case by case basis, based on what feeds you have available and, and what your individual system looks like in order to, to get that feed out to her. It's going to be kind of tough to get, to gain a body condition at this stage of lactation. Yep. Yep, it is going to be hard, so you're probably not going to get, you may not get her turned around completely, but you can at least try to keep her from losing further. Yeah. Kevin, would it be a good, a good opportunity here to dry lot those few thin cows you have and really pour the coal to them? Or I know Ke Kevin's done a lot with dry lotting uh, fall cows and then, and then turning out on grass later. He's unmuted, but yeah, I don't hear anything. How about now? Y'all hear me now? Gotcha, Kevin. All right. So, yeah, what, what people get into is they trying to bucket feed a bunch of aggressive cows that much energy because you're going to be talking at least 8 to 10 pounds of a supplement, like a soy hose or some kind of mix for that extreme situation you just described. And, and that's why I think it's, I think a, a good long-term investment, you know, would be these cube feeders or cake feeders that people have so you can safely put out that kind of feed uh, to aggressive cows, you know, of that quantity. Now there's some, you know, there's some unique things you can do. You can, you can uh, have a pen where you can, you can have the troughs in, put the feed out and then open the gate and let the cows come in if you got enough bunk space where all the cows can get around and eat and then let them in and then run the cows out. You know, it won't take them long to, to clean up feed, you know, mature cows. So you, you can get creative, but feeding that much energy feed usually is, is hard, is a hard sell to a lot of producers. Um, but we get into these drought situations. Y'all got some dry, y'all probably got some 
pastures that are overgrazed yeah. or it didn't have the rain. And every time we get into a drought, dry spell type short pasture situation, we get into this exact situation you just described, Les, about having thin cows that are lactating going into breeding season. And you know, these cube feeders, <laughs> you know, use a little bit of your cake money to buy some, some feed delivery equipment on the farm is probably a really, really good investment, you know. Kind of interesting, Kevin, you brought that up because I don't think a lot of people think about that, but you talk about the aggressive cows and particularly hungry cows. And, uh, you know, it seems like every year we tragically lose somebody or, or get somebody at least seriously injured uh, with cattle. And I bet you it's just as often with friendly cattle that, that are in a situation like that than it is an aggressive cow actually hurting somebody. And yeah, so, and that, uh, and what I mean by aggressive, I didn't necessarily mean mean coming at you, but right. you get cows coming in to, you're going to try to bucket feed, say, 30 cows with and try to put, I mean, they're going to eat that feed as fast as you're trying to wade into that bunk and put it out. And uh, some of the, you know, fence line bunks that, you know, Higgins has, you know, could help you in some of those situations. But, you know, again, putting some thought into how you can deliver feed from a practical standpoint. And I'm going to tell you what, you know, <laughs> Uh, I'll pick on you, Dare. Uh, me and you are the older ones here. You know, we cook the fall with a bucket of feed next to a trough. Maybe we step in some mud if we happen to have mud again, you know. Uh, we trip and fall, and there's, you know, 10 or 12 cows trying to get to the to the bunk where we just fell. You know, they don't have to be mean. They just have to be hungry. So, um, and then, you know, we're hurt. So, I mean, it's, I think there's some there's some pretty neat gadgets out there. You know, for three thousand dollars or less, you can probably have a bulk tank and some kind of feeding apparatus that can go behind an ATV and keep you out of a lot of trouble. Bet folks didn't know they were going to get a, a lesson on on farm safety tonight. <laughs> Any other questions for Dr. Anderson or? Anybody else would we'll be happy to happy to share. Yes. All right. Hi, this yep. is Randy. I, I have a question about um, adding either flaxseed, cottonseed, or raw whole, whole soybeans for say 14 days before breeding to improve conception. That, that in addition to your regular feed that you're feeding. Kevin, Katie? <laughs> well, I, I mean, Katie, you go ahead. I mean, but I I think there's been some pretty good research. I know with whole soybeans, it's to the tune of what, two to three pounds of whole soybeans. Uh, I don't think you want to go much over that, right, Katie, On the from a fat standpoint, is that correct? I would... Think so on the fat standpoint. I'll be honest. I don't know the research that you're you're referring to. So, but that would that would make sense. That that would be one thing you'd want to watch is is fat content. Uh, the technique is called flushing. I don't know if Jeff, Jeff ends up. Is, is he gone there? There you muted. I'm still here. I'm watching. So anyway, Randy, um, um, that technique is called flushing. You're either taking advantage of the the added fat, which increases conception rate, and you can see a bump in conception rate in cattle um, about two, three, sometimes up to four percent. Um, but and there's always a but, right? Um, in mature cows in proper condition, no effect. In young cows, great effect. In thin cows, great effect. And so if you're doing your if you're doing your job with nutrient status at calving and from calving to the start of the breeding season, you're not going to get a huge bump 
in conception rate uh, with your high fat supplements. Um, but that's, you know, that, that's, that's the data that I'm familiar with. Um, Kevin, if uh, either, either you or Katie, if Jeff ever got back on, I know his internet was bad tonight. Um, that's the data that I'm familiar with. Yep, he's, he's, uh, Lim Cooler, he, he must uh, hit a bad spot. So um, he's off. All right. Any last thoughts, questions, anything, anybody? If not, I'm not going to keep you guys. We appreciate everybody joining. Be sure and catch up with us in two weeks uh, for Dr. Van Valen on preparing for winter feeding. And we'll see you guys then. And then we'll have a couple in November as well. So appreciate you guys joining. Um, and we'll see you in two weeks. Good night.